Hey folks, welcome back to another lecture in the Introduction to Earth Sciences lecture series. I'm Dr. Matthew Wileke. Uh, please follow me at Matthew Wileke on Twitter and also subscribe to my Substack, noclimateemergency.substack.com. Uh, today's lecture is lecture four and it's about igneous rocks. And what you see in front of you is the rock cycle that we'll be speaking about over the next three lectures, we'll start with igneous rocks, and then we'll talk about our, our other uh, rock type out of our three, which is sedimentary rocks, and eventually we'll move into metamorphic rocks. And what you see here is the rock cycle, and so remember that matter and mass on the planet is, a, is essentially not created or destroyed, you know, for all, all intents and purposes. And so what we're doing is we're just taking some of the elements and the minerals that we talked about in lecture three and we're kind of moving them around and sometimes we're creating rocks from molten magmas and lavas that's what we're going to talk about today as igneous rocks other times we're making rocks out of little bits of other fragments of rocks and we call those sedimentary rocks we're making those out of sediment and then we will talk about a rock type that goes through a transitional state due to heat and pressure but it doesn't actually melt so we can't call it an igneous rock, but it changes enough that it gets its own classification. We call those metamorphic rocks because they've undergone a metamorphism, much like a caterpillar metamorphosing into a butterfly. We start talking about our rocks with igneous rocks for one primary reason is that it's the dominant rock type in the rocky outer shells of Earth. So remember, Earth has an inner and outer core. Those are primarily iron nickel alloy. The outer core, we believe, is a liquid state, and the inner core is in a solid state. And that's primarily due to the pressure of the inner core. The inner core, although it's hotter than the outer core, is under such high pressure that it's actually not allowed to melt because most substances, when they turn into their liquid phase, they actually expand. Uh, interestingly, water is not one of those. So we know that water in its solid form in ice is actually less dense. It expands a little as it, as it freezes. And we know that because when we put some ice cubes into our drink, we see that those ice cubes float. And so the outer core being liquid, but then it's surrounded by the rocky shell, the mantle and the crust. And the mantle is essentially 100% igneous. The crust is essentially 95% igneous. So we start with igneous rocks because they are the dominant rock type in the rocky shells of the earth. <clears throat> Today, we're gonna to talk about a few different things. We'll cover how igneous rocks are formed. We'll talk about how magmas and lavas move and what's the distinction between those two terms. Why are there different types of igneous rocks in terms of their chemical makeup? How do we classify these chemical rocks? And then we'll talk a little bit about the tectonic settings that we create different igneous rocks in. You'll see that Lecture two, plate tectonics, will be this underlying theme that we always come back to, we'll always be coming back to thinking about what was the plate tectonic setting that these rocks were originally formed in. Uh, the lower left picture, that's me in my long haired hippie days as a, a PhD student at UCLA. This is on the big island of Hawaii. You can see that there's some lava there in those little cracks, so we were able to sample some of that. Um, we poured a little gin out for, for Pele so that we wouldn't be cursed. And I got to actually take a little bit of a rock home that I created. It essentially was molten liquid. And then we took it out, we, we let it cool. And uh, I have a rock that dates back to its formation to about 2012, I believe is the year that I was in Hawaii uh, participating in a astrobiology field camp, which had some really great experiences, one of which was sampling some of the lava flows on the big island of Hawaii. Igneous rocks are derived from the Latin word ignis. That's where we get the word ignition, which means fire. And the fact is that these are rocks that come from molten rock. And molten rock, by definition, has to be very hot. So we're talking on the order of 1,200, 1,500, maybe even a little bit higher degrees Celsius. Um, so these are very, very hot liquids that eventually cool and form igneous rocks, hence the term igneous. So these rocks are formed from the cooling and the solidification or crystallization 
of a magma or a lava. There are several terms to cover. So let's first talk about where igneous rocks uh, form, where do they solidify? When we talk about igneous rocks, we really have a dividing point of the surface of the earth. When things get extruded onto the surface of the earth, we consider that an ex extrusive environment or the extrusive realm. If they are within the crust, we call that an intrusive environment or the intrusive realm because it's intruded in the crust and the other one is extruded onto the surface. There's no real dividing line here. There's a gradual transition, but it's easier to kind of put these into these end member boxes. And you'll see that depending on where the rock forms really dictates what it looks like. So the two rocks on the right here, rhyolite and granite are the same composition. They have essentially the same mineralogy, the same minerals that make them, but because of where they formed, they look very different. So an extrusive, Igneous rock is a rock that forms essentially by the solidification or freezing you can think of. Usually when we think of the term freezing, we think of cold, but this is still, these rocks are essentially freezing just like ice does. They're just doing it at much higher temperatures. This is a rock that forms from the solidification or crystallization of lava at the Earth's surface. And igneous rocks are rocks that form from the solidification of magma underground. So just a quick reminder that the difference difference between magma and lava is where the, where the liquid rock resides. Both of these terms are referring to the molten state of a rock, but if it's within the crust or what we just defined as the intrusive realm, we consider that magma. So you can see the picture on the right below the volcano, we would call that a magma chamber. When that molten rock starts to reach the surface and eventually gets to the extrusive realm, it, we no longer call it magma, we call it lava. So we call the flows of molten rock on the surface lava flows. These two settings are going to have very different characteristics with, in, related to them. And it's really based on how quickly things cool. And so we have to remember that temperature goes up as we go into the earth. And so something that is extruded on the earth will cool very rapidly. And thus it will actually crystallize very quickly. And if it crystallizes really quickly, what that means is that it doesn't have enough time to grow very large crystals. In an intrusive environment, it within the crust, you have the insulation of the surrounding rock, the wall rock that is around the magma chamber, that means that you'll lose heat a little bit slower than you would if you were extruded at the surface. And thus, there's longer periods of time for crystals to actually grow into larger crystal forms. So here's some examples of some extrusive volcanic settings. Here's some lava flows on the Big Island of Hawaii. We'll talk about eventually when we speak about volcanoes, why the lavas in Hawaii can travel such long distances that even though this is being extruded probably tens of kilometers away, it can flow all the way to the ocean. You can get sometimes, if you're lucky, these beautiful images of lavas pouring into the Pacific Ocean, all the steam coming off. Um, the image on the right is a picture of, Mount, of the crater at the top of Mount Vesuvius. But these are what we kind of think of as our extrusive settings, lavas and molten rock at the surface. Um, here are some more images of some ancient lava flows and some of the craters. So this is again Vesuvius in Italy that we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about volcanoes. This is the volcano that destroyed the ancient city of Pompeii and actually was one of the first uh, well-recorded large eruptions that, that was uh, on record in the, in, in the first century. Intrusive settings look a little different because now we're not allowing molten rock to reach the surface. So these are gonna be things that are invading and, and percolating through pre-existing cracks and holes and chambers, right? So this is gonna be a magma chamber or these little lines and dikes and sills that we'll talk about here on the next slide. And this is going to be really hot material because it's molten. So by definition, it's, it's at a very high temperature. 
And so it's going to have an effect on the edges of where it's touching the surrounding rocks, where it's going to bake the surrounding rocks, and it's going to kind of chill the magma right next to those surrounding rocks because the magma, when it's within itself, is staying very hot. But when it's next to rocks that are near the surface, even though it's still insulated by the crust, those rocks are much cooler by definition because they're already solid. And so you have two effects. You have the magma cooking the wall rock a little bit, which we call a bake zone, and then you have the wall rock cooling the magma that's right next to it, which we call the chill margin. Usually intrusive settings look like ch chambers or sills and dikes. So the difference between sills and dikes, these are both tabular intrusions, and sills are, are, are uh, molten material that is going parallel with the bedding planes. So you can see in that image there that you have some rocks laid down horizontally and this intrusion of molten rock comes and squeezes in between two layers and takes advantage of that boundary layer. Dikes would be a, a cut, cross cutting these, uh, these layers. So you can imagine that gray material there on the right picture going vertically where it's cutting across the, the pre-existing layers. Usually intrusive and extrusive settings are occurring together. Magma chambers below will eventually reach the surface. Some of the molten material will reach the surface. So you'll get volcanoes, which are extrusive settings. You'll get lava flows. But you, in order to have lava getting to the surface, you also need magma below within the surface. And so usually these occur together. It just becomes a little simpler for us to put these into end members so that we can discuss the different environments that are there occurring, but realize that in nature, these things are co-occurring with each other. The primary reason that we talk about these realms is because of the crystallization rate. So remember, we just mentioned that it's cooler at the surface than it is within the earth. The, the boundary, the interface of the, surf, the, the solid surface of the Earth and the atmosphere is the coolest portion of the Earth because it's the farthest outside and temperature goes up as you go into the Earth. So if you can get to the very edge of the Earth, the, the solid surface, that's the coolest portion. And so things that get extruded, lavas that get extruded onto the surface, they cool very rapidly. And what that means is that crystallization rate, how fast things crystallize, decreases with depth of the magma as we go down into the earth. And that really does change the texture of the rock. So here are the two rocks that we already introduced before. This is rhyolite and granite. Remember that these are identical in terms of composition and essentially identical in terms of mineralogy. But to the naked eye, you wouldn't be able to actually see the crystals in the rhyolite in the upper image because they're so small. That's our extrusive rock that came and formed from a lava. It reached the surface. It cooled so quickly. The crystallization rate was so fast that all the crystals formed really quickly and they're all really tiny. Now, if you put that under a microscope, you'll be able to see that it has a lot of the similar minerals that the granite below has. You just don't see them with the naked eye. The granite is in our is a, a, an example of our intrusive member that formed from a magma somewhere within the earth. And if you look at that, you can see different shades of colors, pinks, grays, whites, dark colors. And those are individual minerals that formed and if you had this rock in your hand in a little hand sample, you'd be able to clearly see the individual crystal faces of these minerals and they are, they're evident to the naked eye. We have terms for these two types of textures. So for the, what we just described as our rhyolite, the very fine grain texture, we call that affinitic. So this is minerals that are forming and, and, and crystallizing so quickly that they don't get very big. So you essentially need a microscope to be able to see the individual minerals, as opposed to something analogous to the granite that we were just talking about, where you can clearly see the minerals that are on the order of a millimeter or a few millimeters in size. Those are what we call phanaritic textures. These are coarse grained. These crystals had a crystallization rate that was slow enough that they could grow big enough before the whole material became solid. And what that means is that when you look at a rock, 
you can glean a lot of information from that. As I look at this rock, this is a gabbro that we'll introduce in a few slides. We'll go over just a few of the main rock types. We're not going to bog ourselves down too much with trying to memorize rock names. But what we can conclude when we look up at this rock is that we can see the individual crystals. We can see these little green crystals that they're called olivine, essentially from their color. We can see some darker grays, some dark browns, some blacks. These are all different crystals that we're forming. And because we can see them in this image, or we'd be able to see them in a hand sample, we can conclude relatively safely that this rock was formed at some depth, meaning that this rock was formed from a magma, it was in an intrusive environment, and it was cooling slowly enough that the crystals had long enough time to grow such that we could see them. A rock that is chemically identical to that gabbro that we just looked at is a rock that's very analogous to the lava flows that come out in Hawaii. We call that basalt. And so this rock has all of those same little tiny olivines, but it's very hard to see because they, this rock formed from a lava in an extrusive environment. And so this rock cooled so quickly that all those crystals formed and we can't actually see them with the naked eye. We require a microscope, even though chemically these rocks are essentially identical. So the, the image of the rock, just a picture of the rock can give us a lot of information about where the rock formed. Of course, nature is messy. So it's not just gonna allow for affinitic and phaneritic textures. At times we have a mix of both. So here's an example of a rock that has some larger coarse grained white crystals. Those are likely a mineral by the name of plagioclase, but then it has this darker matrix that holds these white crystals in place that we don't really see any individual crystals with. And this is, these are called, the white crystals are called phenocrysts. That's the larger crystals and the surrounding ground mass we call the matrix. And what this is, is essentially a mix of two cooling stages. <clears throat> we call this a porphyritic texture. And this is essentially some slow cooling somewhere in an intrusive environment, such that those larger white phenocrysts could grow. And then something must have triggered an eruption and they get caught up into the magma that's now being extruded onto the surface of the earth as a lava. <clears throat> and then the ground matrix forms and locks those, those phenocrysts in place. And so we see this mix of two stages of cooling, slow cooling to grow the phenocrysts and then rapid cooling to kind of lock the phenocrysts in place within this larger or within this darker ground matrix. When we think about igneous rocks, we wanna come back and think about our classification scheme for minerals. Remember we talked about felsic, that comes from feldspar and silica and mafic that comes from magnesium and the Latin for iron ferric. And so there are some trends that we see in, in, in terms of our igneous rock chemistry. As we go towards the felsic, we see that silica content increases. As we go towards mafic and all the way even to ultra mafic, which just means even more mafic, we'll touch on that a little bit in a minute, iron and magnesium content increase. Density increases as you go towards the ultramafic side, and the color gets darker as you go towards ultramafics because you have a lot of iron and magnesium. You'll see that when we talk about um, volcanoes, that this chemistry is exactly what drives the viscosity, so how easily a, a fluid can flow. So something with a low viscosity has a low resistance to flow. Something with a high viscosity has a high resistance to flow. So low viscosity, you could think of something like water. High viscosity, maybe something like honey that you took out of the fridge, right? It's still gonna flow over time, but it's gonna take a little while for it to actually flow. This is gonna dictate why we have certain types of eruptions in certain types of places and why I felt relatively safe standing on the big island of Hawaii and sampling lavas that were coming out of the big island of Hawaii, where I would never have felt that safe if I knew that Mount St. Helens, for example, was going to erupt. Uh, Hawaii's been continuously erupting since the 80s, and <clears throat> we'll compare these types of eruptions that depend on the chemistry of the magma that's with beneath the surface. So how, do, how does chemistry relate to igneous rocks? So 
in general, we can think of the, the chemistry of a magma is going to look a lot like the rock that it essentially melted to make the magma or the lava in the first place. All right, so if you pick up something and it's felsic, it's pretty safe to assume that that came from a felsic magma. But let's just back up here for a minute. How do we even get molten rock in the first place? Remember that the earth is primarily solid. The liquid outer core is unique in the fact that it's essentially a liquid, but the mantle and the crust are essentially solids. We live on a solid surface of the earth. So how do we get magma in the first place? <clears throat> One thing to recall is that temperature and pressure go up as we go down into the earth. So the deeper we go, the hotter it gets. So that's gonna become important. And we can essentially think of this as melting and freezing. We think of freezing and we think of cold temperatures, but essentially the rocks are doing the same thing that water does when it reaches zero degrees Celsius. It goes from the liquid state and it, you cool it from room temperature down to zero degrees. You put your ice tray into, your, into the, the freezer and when it reaches zero degrees, ice will start to melt and it will, I mean, ice will start to freeze and uh, water will start to freeze. My apologies. And the liquid state will transition into the solid state and that will happen at zero degrees Celsius. If you start to warm that piece of ice back up, you'll see the transition back away from the solid state into the liquid state as it melts again at zero degrees Celsius. So water, because it's, it's mono, uh, it's a single compound, it's H2O, it has a single melting and freezing temperature. But remember that rocks, rocks are an aggregate of minerals. So rocks are made up of a whole bunch of different minerals and each of those minerals has a specific melting and freezing temperature. It's just much, much hotter than water. And so when we talk about how magmas form, we really think about three different types of, of ways that magmas can form, either through decompression, through the additional addition of volatiles, which we call flux melting, or through heat transfer from rising magmas. So let's look at these individually. Decompression is exactly how it sounds. That means to remove pressure. And so remember, as we talked about at the very beginning, that if you increase the pressure, you can reduce how easily something will go into the liquid phase because the liquid phase is usually lower density, water being the exception, and thus there needs to be more room for it to go into the liquid phase. So you can actually squeeze something and raise it above its melting temperature. And then you can reduce the pressure without changing any of the heat and boom, you can get decompression melting. So let's look at that in a visual form. Let's imagine we have rock A and rock A melts at a thousand degrees Celsius. We take rock A and we bury it somewhere deep into the earth, a few kilometers down. And because of that overriding pressure that's squeezing on rock A, we can heat it up slightly above its melting temperature. We can take it up 50 degrees above its 1000 degrees Celsius melting temperature. And the rock will not melt. It just doesn't have enough space to start to go into the liquid phase. So even though it's above its melting temperature, the pressure will keep it solid. Now, if we remove that pressure, we can either remove parts of the surface through erosion, or we can have tectonics move this, move the rock up or down. And as that happens, without changing anything in terms of heat, we can get magma. Because as we start to reduce the pressure, the rock is above its melting temperature. So boom, remove the pressure and you get what we call decompression melting. This is what happens when we talked about divergent plate boundaries. So remember we talked about plate tectonics and we had three different types of plate boundaries, convergence to come together, transform, sliding apart. But then we had one that we called divergence. That was our mid-ocean ridges, the seafloor spreading that Harry Hess discovered when he was working for the US Navy, which eventually proved Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift correct, although it, he expanded on it and it eventually evolved into the theory of plate tectonics. When we have a divergent plate, plate boundary, what we're doing is we're thinning the lithosphere. We're pulling things apart. And imagine pulling silly putty in your hands and what would happen is the little bit that's connecting it would get thinner and thinner and thinner and eventually it would break. That's essentially what's happening at a divergent plate boundary on the crust. 
as the crust is pulling apart, it's starting to thin. What that thinning does, it allows the underlying asthenosphere, this is this hot material that's still solid, but it can flow over geologic time. Silly putty may be a good analogy for that. Silly putty solid, but it kind of can flow over time. And it starts to upwell into this thinning crust. As it upwells, it's moving up through the crust. Thus, it's, it's experiencing lower and lower pressures. And without changing anything in terms of temperature, we can make melt, which eventually emplaces itself into the mid-ocean ridge and then keeps device separating away. And that's how we get these large mid-ocean ridges and these large divergent plate boundaries. And this is exactly why the Atlantic Ocean eventually formed and separated what used to be Pangaea, the supercontinent of Pangaea, and why things like the western coast of Africa and the eastern coasts of the North America and South America appear to fit like a puzzle piece. Another aspect of melting or another way we can get melting is through the addition of volatiles. In this case, when we talk about volatiles, we're talking essentially about things like water and carbon dioxide, things that don't really mix well with the solid rock within the Earth's interior. And these volatiles are really efficient at breaking bonds. And so we consider this flux melting. This is very common in a convergent plate boundary. So this picture here is kind of our cartoon drawing of a convergent plate boundary. This is an oceanic crust on the left that is coming down and subducting underneath the continental crust on the right. You can see the continental crust is thicker, the oceanic crust is thinner, and the lithosphere gets pushed underneath because it's made out of mafic rocks and thus it's more dense. And this is what we call the destruct destructive plate boundary because we're actually destroying the plate. We're pushing it back into the earth and we're recycling it. And because temperature increases as the plate goes down, and because this plate was at the bottom of the ocean for millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of years, it's very saturated. So there's a lot of water, there's a lot of CO2 and all the little shells and buggers and things that sank that make their uh, exoskeletons out of things like calcium carbonate. And so that material is going to flux across off of the subducting lithosphere and it's going to start to mix with the surrounding hot rocks and it's going to cause those rocks to melt. So let's go through our little visualization again. So here's a rock, our rock A, the same rock that melts at a thousand degrees Celsius. And now it's sitting in the mantle and it's close to its melting temperature, but it's still below. It's at 950 degrees Celsius. So it's remaining solid but it's right next to a subducting plate of oceanic lithosphere. And that oceanic lithosphere is fluxing a lot of volatiles off as the plate is being subducted and experiencing these increases in temperature and pressure. It starts to release a lot of these liquids and these gases. And when those liquids and gases, those volatiles start to mix with rock A, it, what it does is it essentially depresses the melting temperature of rock A and thus even though it's not at its melting temperature at the surface it's at 50 degrees below boom you can get melting because you're starting to mix these volatiles in and these volatiles are really efficient at breaking the bonds and turning a solid into a liquid. The last one is kind of, notice that both of those involved no heat transfer. We weren't changing the temperature at all. In the first one, we were decompressing, we were changing pressure. In the second one, we were mixing volatiles into the rocks. And there's no change in pressure in either. I mean, no change in temperature in either of those. Here in heat transfer, this is essentially our, our what we think of usually, this is a hot iron onto rocks. So you can see that there's some magma coming up and it is basically ponding or pooling at the base of the crust. It's hot enough that it's heating the rocks above it, and it can get so hot that it can start to cause those rocks to melt. So this is actually an increasing in temperature. This is analogous to taking an iron and leaving it on your shirt, and your shirt will have a big black burn because you're transferring heat from the iron into the fabric. So this is the same thing, but you can think of the iron coming up from deep in the earth. That's the magma cooking the base of the crust, melting some of the crust, and creating new magma that can eventually reach the surface as lava. So in this one, we are actually using a temperature difference as opposed to the other two. So the chemistries of magmas are analogous, like we mentioned before, to 
our chemistries of minerals and we divide them into these felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. Remember that I think it's beneficial just to get rid of two of these. I prefer to get rid of intermediate and ultramafic and think about felsic and mafic. So felsic is the high amounts of silica, light in color, low in density. This is analogous to continental crust. Mafic coming from magnesium and the Latin for iron, uh, ferric. These are high amounts of magnesium and iron. These are dark in color. They're low in silica. They have a high density. This is analogous to the uh, oceanic crust. And then you can just think of the other two as ultramafic is more mafic than mafic. They're essentially only found at great depths and don't really produce a lot of crustal rocks. They tend to be mainly found in the mantle. And then intermediate is simply a mixture between mafic and felsic. So I think if you understand felsic and mafic, that essentially gives you the whole classification scheme for all of these. The factors that control magma composition are very important. So the factors that control magma composition are the source rock, partial melting that we'll talk about in, in particular, assimilation and magma mixing. So let's talk about these individually. The source rock is very important. Remember we mentioned that essentially if you find something that's felsic, you see a felsic rock, you can make a relatively safe assumption that the magma that it formed from was felsic. Or when I see the basalts that are all over the big island of Hawaii, those dark rocks uh, of, of flows that we actually will define, they have two terms, pahoho and aa. -a. Those are the two different types of lava flows that occur in Hawaii that we'll talk about when we have a volcanoes lecture. These are uh, mafic rocks. This, is a, this was a mafic lava. I can essentially assume that this was a mafic lava that, that made it um, because of the rock type. So the source rock does tell you something about the composition, but we know that the compositions change. So there's got to be a way that we can actually change things. The main way that we change things is because rocks don't actually fully melt. We call it partial melting. So this is a little bit complex, so we're going to go through this kind of slowly. Let's think about a bowl of chocolate chip ice cream. If we leave that bowl of chocolate chip ice cream on the counter, what we see is that the ice cream will melt first. The ice cream is light in color, so this is going to be analogous to our felsic minerals. So the felsic minerals will melt first, but if we come back in an hour, what we'll see is we'll see a, a bowl of a, a soup, of white soup, which will be the, the vanilla ice cream that has melted, but the chocolate chips will still be solid, right? Because they're solid at room temperature. And so when we think about how this bowl of ice cream is melting, it's not all melting uniformly. It's, has, it's going through a process that's very analogous to how the rocks melt, which we call partial melting. The ice cream portion is melting while the chocolate chip portion is actually staying in the solid form. And we have to remember that at any given time in the earth, there's really only about two to a few tens of percent of melt that is forming magma. It's really rare on on earth that an entire rock will fully melt. Usually what we're doing is we're partially melting rocks. We're never really getting them up to temperatures where they can fully melt, but we get them hot enough that certain portions of them will melt. And so you'll see that we'll talk about in a minute, the felsic minerals melt first, and therefore the melted portion is going to look very different than the rock that you're melting itself. In our bowl of ice cream, the melted liquid had no chocolate in it, but the solid ice cream eventually at, at the beginning had both chocolate and vanilla. And so we're going to see that we can actually change the composition of the rocks on earth by melting certain portions of them. And so the melted portion looks very different. And now the rock that we left behind looks different because we're extracting a component from that rock. Another example here is some raisin bread. So let's assume that the raisins here are felsic minerals and the bread is the mafic minerals. And in this image, I'm just giving a hypothetical. Let's say it's somewhere on the order of 20% felsic and 80% mafic. And now if I magically could melt the raisins and remove them, 
and turn this raisin bread into something like this, well, the raisin bread looks different because I've removed the raisins, I've removed a component. So now we have 5% felsic and 95% mafic. And the raisins that I pulled away, they would be 100% felsic because it would just be pure raisins, right? And so these are some analogies that will help you think about how this happens. Here's a, a, a schematic of how this works in nature. So on the left-hand side, what we're doing, we're looking at a rock. The rock has composed of some of these gray minerals that we're going to be considering felsic minerals and some of these darker minerals that we're going to consider mafic minerals. On the left-hand side, we are in a relatively cool regime, so there's no molten rock. You can see in the image there that there's no reddish material showing. And so the rock is solid and happily sitting there, even though it's getting pretty hot. As we cross the line there, the vertical line, that's the melting point. We call that the liquidus. That's where we start to form some liquid. And, at, or sorry, the solidus. We fall, that's where we, we go out of the solid phase and we start to form some of the liquids. And you can see that there's a little bit of orange or red starting to form. And in the upper uh, portion, you can see that that liquid that's forming is very high in silica because it's dominated by the felsic component. And so as this rock is melting, notice the gray minerals are shrinking faster than the darker minerals. The felsic minerals are melting quicker because they have lower melting temperatures than the dark minerals. And so the, the, the liquid that's forming is really high in silica at the beginning. Now, if you melt the entire rock, which we call the liquidus, then the composition is back to what you started with because you've melted 100% of the rock. But if you recall, we just talked about that, that never really happens within the earth. Usually we're melting just a few percent or maybe a few tens of a percent. And so usually the liquid fraction looks very different than the rock itself. And now the remaining rock will look different as well. Another way that we can control or change the composition is through assimilation. So assimilation means incorporation. And remember that if you have hot magma and it's somewhere within the crust, it's interacting with the rocks, the wall rocks that are holding and creating the walls of the magma chamber. And occasionally those rocks are melting or falling in and melting. And so they're assimilating into the crust, they're, I mean, into the magma, they're becoming incorporated into the magma. And if their composition is slightly different than the magma, then they're contributing their, their components, their elemental components into the magma. And thus we're changing the overall chemistry of the magma. Another way is just by mixing magma chambers. So you can have two magma chambers, one that's a felsic magma, one that's a, basalt, a mafic magma, and you can have a interconnection form between those two. And then what happens is you turn the felsic magma into an intermediate magma as you're pumping more of this mafic magma uh, up through into chamber B, right? So this is just essentially mixing two end, end, end members, two components, usually the sum is different than the, than the two parts that you added. And so why does magma want to rise? Because eventually magma reaches the surface a lot of times and becomes lava. That's why we have volcanoes. Well, one of the reasons is for what we just talked about. Remember that we just said that the, the rocks don't fully melt and the portion that melts first is the felsic portion. And remember that felsic rocks are what make up continental crust. They're the low density rocks. That's why they sit above sea level. Mafic rocks are the, are, are the rocks that are, make the oceanic crust. That's why they sit kind of lower. And that's why when you pour water onto a dry planet, it fills in the low lying areas. The oceans exist where they do because the density of the rock of the oceanic crust. And so if the magma that we're making is felsic because we're me melting the felsic component. That means by definition, it's going to be less dense than the surrounding rock around it. Also, the pressure of all the rock that's pushing down on it is trying to squeeze it towards the surface. And because it's now a liquid, it can start to work its way through all of the pores and cracks and irregularities that are within the crust and work its way towards the surface. So something that we have to think about now as this liquid is moving through the, the crust of the earth or the mantle of the earth even, is 
viscosity. So viscosity is this term that we defined earlier as the resistance to flow. And if you're ever going to go get your oil changed, I recommend that you don't wake up on a cold morning and then just drive your car right around the corner to get your oil changed because what you'll find is that the oil will be very sludgy it will be very thick and the whole reason for an oil change is to remove a lot of that sludge that's within the car that eventually builds up some of the combustible material that gets mixed into the oil that makes it dark we want to remove that such that when we put clean oil in we have a less friction than we have less wear and tear on the motor so the car can drive for a longer time and the best so the best thing you could do is if you're on a cold morning and you're gonna go and get your oil changed turn your car on let it run for 15 minutes in the driveway let it get all the way up to full operating temperature and then drive it over to the to the local uh, oil change place and have them change the oil because now the viscosity will be lower. It will flow out like water instead of sludge and it will remove all of that material that you wanna get out of the oil pan such that when you put new oil in, it's nice and fresh and keeps, keeps wear and tear down. So viscosity is the res resistance to flow. High viscosity would be something like syrup a low viscosity would be something like water. This is something that people mix up a lot because they think about resistance to flow. And so high viscosity, they think, oh, that must be a high flow, but actually high viscosity is a low flow, something like syrup or honey out of the fridge because the term means the resistance to flow. It's almost a negative term. And so this confuses people a lot. As we just mentioned, temperature is one of those things that affects the viscosity of oil. So that's definitely something that, ex that affects also the viscosity of a magma is how hot it is. But a couple other things also uh, dictate how much or how, how much or, or how, how great or low the viscosity of a magma or lava is. We talked about temperature, but the other two would be the volatile content and the silica content. And what we find is that a high viscosity magma, so something that is very resistant to flow, it doesn't really want to flow, it's very thick. That is something that is a relatively low temperature, it's a relatively low volatile content, and it has a high silica content. It's really this resistance to flow, it's this thickness that allows it to build up such great pressures that you can have explosive volcanic eruptions like Mount St. Helens, for example. We'll come back to that when we talk about our volcanoes lecture. On the opposite side of the spectrum, low viscosity magmas, so things that have a low resistance to flow, they flow essentially like water. They have high temperatures, high volatile contents, and low silica contents. And remember that magma, how fast magma cools is really dictated by where it is, right? The coffee in your thermos is gonna stay a lot warmer because it's insulated, just like the magma in the crust is insulated by the rocks. Then for example, a coffee cup that you spilled on the table, that's gonna cool very quickly. Analogous to how quickly lava cools when it gets extruded onto the surface. And as it cools, we're going to have partial melting in reverse. So partial melting, we're heating a rock up from the solid state into a liquid state. Remember, we're only melting a portion of it. That's why we call it partial melting. In fractional crystallization, we're doing the opposite. We're going from the liquid state and we're going back towards the solid state. We're cooling it down. But again, because the minerals don't all freeze or solidify at the same temperature, you're gonna get fractions of minerals that are crystallizing at different times, hence the name fractional crystallization. And it's gonna work in the opposite way that partial melting works. So because felsic minerals melt first, that means that they will solidify last. And so our ultra mafix and our mafix will start to solidify first because they have the highest melting temperatures, meaning they have the highest freezing or solidifying temperatures. So if we're coming down from a really hot temperature, those are the first things that are gonna form. The felsic material is still gonna be completely molten. And so as they form, they're gonna pull their mafic component out of the melt 
and they're going to sink to the bottom because almost everything, the solid phase is more dense than the liquid phase. And as they do that, they pull the mafic component out of the magma and they create a magma or they leave a magma behind that is more felsic. And eventually as things form, the felsic minerals will form last. And then now you have a solid igneous rock. This is all dictated by what we call Bowen's reaction series. Don't worry about these page numbers. The Bowen's reaction series is a um, is a uh, experiment that was done by a famous scientist by the last name of Bowen. And what they did was they recorded what types of crystals form at what types of temperatures. Before that, scientists pretty much thought that rocks would behave a lot like water. A certain rock would have a certain melting temperature. The whole thing would melt at that temperature. And then if you cooled it below that temperature, the whole thing would crystallize. And it was Bowen that realized that actually the individual minerals have their own distinct melting and cooling and, and solidifying temperatures. And thus there is this reaction series as you go up from on the left hand side, we have the temperature regime. So at the very top is the highest temperature, pure liquid. And then as we go down, we crystallize and notice that the first things that start to crystallize are the ultra mafix. That's on the right hand side, the composition. We're not going to worry about so much the mineral names themselves, but these are some minerals that you saw in lecture three. The next component will be the mafic component. The next component will be the intermediate component. Eventually, the felsic component will, will solidify. And now you have a completely solid rock. It's still pretty darn hot, but eventually that rock can cool such that you can get a granite countertop maybe in your uh, home or your apartment where you're listening to this lecture. When we talk about the naming and trying to characterize and classify igneous rocks, the rocks are really based on their composition and their texture. So we, we divide the composition into those four members that we talked about, felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. And then we divide our uh, textures into affinitic, or in this case, on this plot, fine-grained, and phaneritic, or coarse-grained. And so every composition and every texture has its own name. And we're going to go through a couple of these pretty quickly because we're not really in the business of memorizing rock names for our purposes here. All of this is happening together. So we like to put these things into end members and think about all of these in their individual boxes. But remember, nature is messy. So in any one uh, uh, volcanic region, you're going to have all the different types of compositions or some different types of compositions, maybe not all of the extremes. You're going to have all of your different types of textures. Um, we'll talk about some of these pyroclastic and glassy textures when we talk about um, uh, when we talk about volcanoes, we'll, we'll, we'll introduce glassy in a couple slides. But you can see our phaneritic texture that's deep within the crust. Our porphyritic texture is this mix, this kind of two-stage cooling. Our affinitic texture is our lavas that got onto the surface that cooled very quickly. We'll talk about what pyroclastic means when we talk about volcanoes, and we'll talk about glassy texture here in a couple slides. So let's talk about some naming of igneous rocks, right? We're going to look at each of our compositional, uh, uh, our compositional uh, end members, and we're going to talk about the affinitic and the phaneritic rock types and the names for each. We'll start with the felsic component and with what we call our phaneritic uh, texture, right? This is an intrusive environment. You can see the individual crystals on this. This may look analogous to possibly your countertop in your bathroom or your kitchen. This is granite. So this is predominantly quartz and feldspar. This is very abundant in, for example, the continental crust. Um, a felsic rock member, it's low in density, you can see it's light in color, and you can see clearly the grains. This is the rhyolite that we already talked about as our end member on the affinitic side. So this was in an extrusive environment, it formed from a lava. Again, it has the same mineralogy and the same silica content, it's low in density. It just cooled so quickly that you don't see the individual crystals. Doesn't make for as pretty of a countertop. 
A couple other of ig felsic igneous rocks are things that are like obsidian. So obsidian is a glassy texture. So this is a rock that cooled so quickly that essentially the, the elements couldn't organize themselves and there isn't really any sort of minerals. Everything is essentially randomly distributed. And obsidian, we talked about this already a little bit when we talked about uh, uh, what makes a mineral. Remember that a mineral has to have an ordered crystalline structure, so this glassy texture actually doesn't qu qualify as a, as a mineral, but we do consider obsidian a rock. Um, it is essentially the same composition as our granite and our rhyolite, except it has this darker color because it's so random that the light doesn't essentially pass through it. It can become very sharp, and it's why uh, the Native Americans would use this as arrowheads. It's why, for example, gl a broken glass can cut you, is because of this disordered crystalline structure, you can get really sharp edges. And so there's claims that obsidian can get as sharp as, for example, surgical steel in some cases. The other the rock type below we call pumice. This is a one of the only rocks that can float. You may have this in your shower for exfoliation of your feet and things like that. This is essentially a granitic rock or a rhyolitic rock, the same as the ones that we were looking at before in terms of composition. But this rock had so much uh, of volatiles in it. There was so much gas that was uh, were trying to escape from the rock as it was solidifying. It's essentially like freezing the foam uh, of a soda. You pour some soda into a cup and it makes that big foam on the top. And if you froze that, that's essentially what pumice is. That's why all those gas bubbles are in there. And that's one of the reasons that it essentially floats. If we move into our intermediate end members, so in intermediates, you're starting to see now a mix of lighter and darker colors. This is our phaneritic end member. So this is from an intrusive environment. This is very common also in the continental crust. This is known as a rock type called diorite. It's a little bit lower in silica. You can see that there's been a little bit more of these dark minerals, these mafic minerals, now can make up at least about 25% of the rock. It has this kind of even mix of light and dark colors. Here is the, a porphyritic andesite. So this is what makes up things like, for example, Mount St. Helens. This is an intermediate Aphanitic rock that was extruded onto the surface. In this image here, you can see that there are some phenocrysts. Those are those bigger light colored crystals. So this would be a porphyritic texture. And this is analogous to, for example, Mount St. Helens that we'll talk about in the volcanics lecture. If we move over to our mafic compositional end member, when the rock is in its, in, in its intrusive environment or in the intrusive realm, the phaneritic texture, this is known as a gabbro. So this is one of the rocks that we looked at when we were talking about what we can, what visual clues we can get from looking at a rock. This one's a little bit harder to see all the individual olivine crystals. A lot of this type of rock is what makes up the oceanic crust. So this is mafic. You can see it's darker in color. The numbers of silica percent have gone down. And that dark color is because you're getting a predominance of magnesium and iron, which is increasing the density. If that material gets extruded onto the surface and has an affinitic texture, we call that basalt. And so this is an example of basalt that we already talked about, for example, from Hawaii. And all of these rocks are essentially forming in uniform. An image like this is really informative because you can see here, you can see dikes and sills. You can see the intrusive environment, the extrusive environment. You can see our mafic and our felsic rocks, all of our different uh, crystallization textures um, and realizing that all of these things are occurring together. It makes it simpler for us to kind of put them into boxes and individual end members, but nature's messy and there's all these transitions in between. And so um, it's just for simplicity of explanation that we do that. All right, well, thanks a lot. That's our first rock type. And when we start talking about the rock cycle, in our next lecture, we'll talk about sedimentary rocks followed by metamorphic rocks. And then eventually we'll work our way into talking about some natural hazards like volcanoes and earthquakes. And then we'll transition into discussing things like how do we figure out the ages of rocks. We'll talk about the hydrologic cycle and a little bit about the atmospheres.
Uh, if you enjoyed this lecture, please uh, subscribe to this channel and share it with anybody and everybody that you can. Um, you can follow me at Matthew Wyleke on Twitter, and I encourage you to subscribe to my Substack, noclimateemergency.substack.com, where I talk a lot about some of the misconceptions in particularly the mainstream media about climate change. And um, I'm, a, I'm a staunch believer that the climate is changing and that humans do have an impact on their environment. However, I think a lot of the catastrophizing that occurs in the mainstream media is not supported by the data. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect in the narrative that we get from the internet and online and even in the print media and on TV than is actually supported by the scientific data. All right, well, once again, thanks again and uh, have a great day.